My name is Julian Lindley French and I am the chairman of the Alphen Group. What can the West do collectively and otherwise in support of Ukraine? Well, there's a lot we can do. Tragically for Ukrainians, the massive majority of it is indirectly. First, the immediate aims must be fourfold. One, to de-escalate the immediate threat. It's not too late for diplomacy, even at this stage. Two, to preserve the rights of Kiev as any sovereign Euro European sovereign state to choose its own alliances, both now and into the future. Three, to convince Russia that the use of such coercion will not work and will be prohibitively expensive strategically, politically, and economically. Second, over the short and medium term, NATO's military response must reinforce the eastern flank of our alliance. One, by strengthening the enhanced forward presence, particularly in the Baltic states. Two, by accelerating and expanding the NATO readiness initiative, and by moving headquarters allied re rapid reaction corps from England to near Warsaw, reinforced by American, British, German, and Polish forces. Three, to use HQ ARC as the command and develop, development element for a new European-led high-end first responder allied mobile heavy force. This is the centerpiece of the just published uh, NATO shadow strategic concept uh, by the Arfen Group and should be front and center to the real forthcoming uh, NATO strategic uh, concept. Third, Western European governments in particular must also take a longer term view. They must regrip the longer term. For too long, we have been focused on short term transactional politics at the expense of a longer term strategy. Several of us have been warning of this crisis for years, and this is just the beginning. It will evolve further. Critically, the strategic illiteracy from which many European leaders have suffered for far too long must now come to an end. And they can demonstrate that by agreeing collectively specific actions that need to be taken. One, develop coherent national strategy processes and invest in collective strategy for both NATO and the EU, as well as for other alliances, such as AUKUS uh, with partners in, in the Indo-Pacific. Two, apply really thought out, considered and effective sanctions on the Kremlin, taking account of the fact that Putin has striven to reduce Russia's vulnerability to such sanctions in recent years. They must bite. Three, reconcile the Western desire to invest in Russia and indeed China as high gain, low risk opportunities with our own national security interests and the need to regain our own national competitive stance. We are in effect paying for much of the force that Russia is using to threaten Ukraine. Four, create energy independence. That is a urgent requirement on a national basis and with international collaboration. And that will mean reconciling uh, objectives such as the carbon net zero goals with the need to move through a transitional energy phase in which renewables are indeed matched by the extraction of fossil fuels. Five, deal robustly and comprehensively with corrupt Russian money. The many funds invested in Europe's capitals and the vulnerability to Russian influence through reliance on Russian investment and business. Six, invest more and more sens sensitively and sensibly and cost effectively in classic military defense. That's not legacy defense. This is a defense and deterrence posture that will be credible in a future war environment in which emerging disruptive technologies will accelerate the pace of war. Our adversaries will have no ethical constraints upon the use of these technologies in search of dominance. Right now, Russia has missile and nuclear dominance in Europe, and it will seek hypersonic dominance in Europe. 
When we invest in classical defense, it is a future defense which must be the focus of our efforts. Seven, get serious about fighting hybrid and cyber war to counter what is already being used against us. We will see a growing merger, a narrowing of the spectrum between hybrid, cyber, and real war in the coming years, in which the resilience of our societies will be as important as the fighting power of our forces. They're two sides, sides of the same deterrence and defense coin. And we must see our future planning precisely in that light. Eight, work with Ukraine to develop more effective forms of assistance, military, economic, good governance, strengthening societal resilience. We must help turn Ukraine into the modern European democracy that it aspires to be whatever Moscow might think and whatever Moscow might connive to achieve. Finally, if we are to collectively and effectively deter President Putin, and this is all about deterrence, no one wants war in Europe, not another major war. We've all seen in history what war can do, and yet war could happen. And European leaders must escape from the denial from which they've suffered that such a war could happen. And that means getting serious about our national policies and getting serious about NATO, our primary shield, our primary deterrent, and our primary defense. And that re means, sadly, tragically in many ways, but necessarily remembering the words of Vegesius in the third century. Sivis pacem, parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. It is not the militarization of Europe that I call for, but a sensible minimum conventional nuclear and technological deterrent that can preserve peace in Europe. For too many years, our leaders, in the face of constant warnings, not least from people like myself, have let this situation slide, let it deteriorate, and let it decay to the point where President Putin can consider successfully unleashing his forces in Europe for the second time in a decade. That must end. The beginning of the end is now. Indeed, let me conclude by quoting the words of Winston Churchill in the wake of the 1942 British victory at El Alamein. He said, this is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Let us make this the end of Putin's beginning and the beginning of Putin's end. Thank you very much.